You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 63. This podcast, say it with me, y'all, is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. If you're just tuning in for the first time, Hi, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. This week's episode sounds a little different than the other ones. I've been experimenting with different remote recording softwares, and this one isn't great, but the interview is incredible. So I promise, usually the sound quality in interviews is way better. It was really important to me from the beginning of starting this podcast that the sound quality be really good. I not produced by a podcast production company or anything like that. I do this all through the donations of Patreons. So I have an amazing sound editor, and he did the best he could with this episode. But the quality is still a bit weird. I've rectified the problem, but that's what's up with that. If you do want to help the podcast get even better than it is right now, please, please, please go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Patreons give small amounts of money every month to help the podcast succeed, and in return, they get all sorts of special prizes, discounts on cool artist-athlete swag, and much more. If you're not a Patreon because, I don't know, you can't spare a dollar a month, if something's going on, I get it, but you still want to support the podcast subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating and a review. Preferably a good one, but I don't think it really matters. That's how this podcast moves up in the charts. I don't (laughs) know how high a super niche topic like circus would actually move up in the charts, but it would be pretty cool to see. So patreon.com slash the artist athlete and subscribe, rate, and view to help us out. My guest today is Micah Walters. Micah Walters is a hybrid, part gymnast, part ballerina, and all legs. His urge to dance comes to the surface in a thrill of musical acrobatics. He was originally trained in classical gymnastics and studied under a Russian system passed down from Vladimir Novikov to an American-owned gym in the suburbs of Charleston, South Carolina. The discipline and movement philosophy of the Russian system stuck, never to sacrifice the quality of your form to merely complete a skill. This mantra guided Micah in his performance as well as his approach to teaching. Micah acquired certifications through the NASM, including corrective exercise specialists and sports performance specialists. He also holds certifications in yoga and Aerial Lotties, which uses aerial conditioning to rehabilitate and strengthen bodies. Okay, here for that. He currently lives in Los Angeles, where he coaches students online through a carefully crafted system called the Michael Walters Movement. He uses video chat to help students master conditioning and flexibility basics that help reverse compensations and rewire faulty movement patterns. He also travels to teach workshops, masterclasses, and teacher tune-ups. I had Micah on the show because I've been a big fan of his Instagram account for a really long time. I think some of what he posts is really smart. He's micah.walters.movement on Instagram. If you guys go follow him, we do get a little heady in this conversation about flexibility training. So sometimes a visual can be really helpful. And I'll be posting some stuff this week, if you're tuning in when the podcast airs, to illustrate some of the concepts we've talked about as well. Here's my interview with Micah Walters. Micah Walters, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. (laughs) Thank you, Shannon McKenna. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Yay. And so I always start by asking the guests to say who they are and what they do. My name is Micah Walters. I'm a contortion coach, flexibility coach, part yoga teacher, part aerial Pilates teacher. I have a couple dozen certifications of physical training expertise, and I use them all towards the means of helping my students increase flexibility. I do that in person at Fit and Bendy and Cirque School LA, and I do it online via FaceTime and Skype. So I'm more or less a flexibility encyclopedia, and I walk around with nothing else in my head pretty much all day long. (laughs) So that's me. You're not only a coach, you're also quite bendy yourself. Yes, I am a performer. I'm a recovering gymnast. I like to say recovering since <laughs> it is an addiction, gymnastics. It's, once you get out of it, you're, you're in recovery and you, you find your next fix and hopefully it's a little healthier. Uh, so yeah, I started as an athlete very young and I learned a lot about gymnastics and then I learned dance. I did ballet. I did contemporary. I did all the little dance competition-y things. And then later in life, when I moved to San Francisco, I found circus. And it helped me to sort of combine my skills and enjoy what I was doing and explore what I was passionate about. So, Okay. Did you work with Searchma? Was she your contortion um, person? No, I've never worked with Searchma. In fact, okay. I've never worked with a contortion coach. I have taken some classes but I've never subscribed to a coach's programming, mostly because I have a very unique body. I'm 6'4". I'm very tall. Holy Uh, crap, you're 6'4"? I'm 6'4". I'm a giraffe in the world of circus, uh, which is is kind of funny to see me on stage taking like a bow, like in the middle, you know, at the end of a show, you see me in comparison with everyone else, and you're like, okay, giant on the stage. So I have such a unique body and a unique skill set. I feel like my education took place in my youth, and now I'm using the skills and the intuition and mindset that I've been able to develop to be my own coach, more or less. And certainly, I employ the use of lots of techniques that I've learned to teach, and I teach myself. Gotcha. That's so cool. I feel like people so often like will give up because they don't feel like they have a body type for it. But you kind of found your own way. I did. Like. Oh, yeah. I mean, those types of people tend to gravitate towards me. Mm. Because you've overcome some obstacles with your body, so maybe you can help me overcome mine. Mm. And, yeah, I, I, I really just love it so much. I can't imagine anything getting in the way of it. And I don't think it was possible for me to ever stop doing this and stop loving it, especially because it's hard. Like, that's just the greatest part of it. (laughs) Right? Yeah, you can't get bored. Yeah, and it's not like I can really focus too much of my thoughts on like, well, what if I were shorter? Well, what if my legs weren't, you know, (laughs) four and a half feet long and 80 pounds a piece, you know? So I'm just enjoying the gifts that I've been given, which are plenty and many, and, you know, doing my best to like cultivate what I can with what I have. That's so awesome. (laughs) I have one more question about kind of your background, which is when you were in gymnastics, what was your like discipline? Funny enough, I had the body type for events like pommel horse, like parallel bars, like high bar. Okay. The long and lean body types tend to score well on those events because your legs are dangling the whole time and a pretty line goes a long way. But my passion was tumbling and vaulting. So I really loved to be powerful and to punch the floor exercise and get as much air as I could. I also was a total, I didn't know that what I wanted to be was a performer. I thought that it was just Olympic gymnastics or nothing. Mm. And I'm using the floor exercise as an opportunity to incorporate dance, presentation, and tumbling and gymnastics. So floor was absolutely my favorite. And I was pretty damn good at it, not to toot my own horn, but I, I obsessed over it. I tumbled in my front yard. I taught myself how to twist and I learned how to use my body type to score high and to have fun. So, yeah, I think the reason I'm asking is because like 
like a lot of traditional contortion, especially when I look at like Mongolian contortion or that kind of stuff is very static. And like a very flexible body doesn't usually lend itself to dynamic movement. But what's so cool about you and your work is that you kind of have both elements. You're bendy, but you're also dynamic. And yeah. that's, that's really cool. Which one came first or how did you train the other one in? You know, you have to combine the two elements together in gymnastics. There's an element of flexibility that is compulsory. It's required. Each and every routine in gymnastics, in men's gymnastics, has to contain a 180 degree split of some sort. If you ever watch the Olympics, you'll see them take a little rest, they'll pop down to their belly, they'll put a leg forward or come to middle split and show their flexibility and it's required. So that's, they, the two kind of do go hand in hand up to a certain point. I think the extreme back flexibility, not so much because of the power and how it revolves around that center column of your spine. You don't want an excess of mobility. So my leg flexibility was always pretty outstanding, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and then once I, in my 20s, I started to really explore back bending. And I did notice that it took away a little bit of my power. And a little bit of the tumbling that I was able to do is, has kind of gone away. I don't practice it regularly, and that certainly could be the case. But I noticed that like, oh, a super flexible spine doesn't necessarily lend itself to dynamic double back flips, double front flips, things that have to move like through G-force type of power. But at a certain point, they can sort of meld together and, and work off of each other, flexibility and dynamic movement. So you have students now and you have your Michael Walters movement is your brand and your program. What's your approach? My approach is a combination of gymnastics type conditioning. I rely a lot on prehab, so exercises that are meant to strengthen the core muscles. Uh, super important for backbending that the core muscles are aligned and helping you to further align your spine. So my approach is based on a combination of conditioning that focuses on core stability endurance. Um, mm. It's actually something that helped me to heal a back injury from my early 20s that I sort of carried around with me from my gymnastics days. And I, I learned a lot about myself through rehabbing that injury and started to notice similarities and struggles that my students were having. And so I developed a, an approach that I like to call mindful contortion. And it's an approach that might look a little unfamiliar to the traditional approach of contortion, Mongolian contortion. It's a lot less passive mobility. It's a lot more active mobility. It really revolves around cobra pose. Cobra pose allows you to use your arms as two posts for your back bend. And my goal for my students is for them to be able to achieve hands-free cobra. So using the muscles in the back of your spine to lie prone and lift the spinal column up one piece at a time to match active and passive mobility. Is that your starting off point for students? Like once they can do that, then they move towards other things? It's kind of a starting off point, and it's also just something to keep drawing back to. A lot of my students, I call them the, the noodles, and they have really fantastic passive mobility and maybe some hypermobility. And passive so, mobility is like just, can you explain the difference a little bit? Sure. I like to use the example of Cobra. So certainly Cobra is somewhat active. You're pushing into the floor with your arms. You're maybe even squeezing your glutes and engaging your back muscles to achieve a back bend. And compare that to doing cobra without your hands. Finding how to, or experimenting with using the muscles in your spine to develop your back bend without the elements of pushing that your arms might have or that an external force might be exerting on you, pulling you back or holding you back. So it's how much of that mobility can you support on your own within your own spinal column in reference to back flexibility. So there's kind of this principle that I like to tell students to help them understand this. And it's kind of like Newton's law of 
every action has an opposite and equal reaction. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true in your body. So if you take, for example, a front split, right leg forward, uh, your right hamstring is being lengthened since you've lifted your leg into hip flexion. Your left hip flexors are in extension since you've moved your leg back behind your hip. To achieve active flexibility in that, you want to think about that Newton's law. So your front leg should push down towards the floor. Your back leg should push down towards the floor to engage the opposite reaction. So it's almost like you're trying to stand up out of your split to engage the muscles that are opposite of the ones that are stretching. Exactly. You could use it to overcome that force and even slide up from your split, or you could apply it in the hopes of, quote unquote, squaring your hips. So activating the lengthened muscles in their end range to either support that end range or to lift up out of it. Mm, gotcha. Manipulate any, any element, back bend, flexing the back knee, toes to head, whatever it is that you're hoping to achieve in that split or in that cobra, there's an element of reaction. So there's the pose and then there's the unpose, I call it. The unpose. the unpose. Ooh. Paradoxical. <laughs> and it's a great way to help students learn about the transitions between movements because I think so often with the Instagram culture we find these photos of poses that we try and we see them in our head as this static thing that we're going to hold and we move further and further in one direction until we hit a wall but in fact yeah. there are more than just one directions in that pose there's multiple facets of that to focus on and even though you might not see someone moving within a pose, there are contrasting actions happening all at once. So using it in terms of motion, we're always in motion and it's motion that moves us forward. So the pose itself and the unpose can sort of create a dynamic relationship within the contortion practice. That's so interesting. I love that, the unpose. Unpose. <laughs> you use also from stalking your Instagram for years. I really love your use of props. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you do a really interesting job of integrating uh, like yoga blocks and foam rollers and that kind of, those kinds of things into your work with your students. Where did that come about? Well, in 2015, <clears throat> maybe it was 2016 actually, I did a yoga teacher training. I used to be very close to a very prominent yoga teacher and he allowed me to take his yoga teacher training for free in exchange for me teaching a few sections of the teacher training about handstands and inversions. So mm. I got like a really first class education in yoga instruction. Now I know what that, style of yoga is it? Do you mind me asking? <laughs> it was a style that was a conglomerate of Iyengar. Mm -hmm vinyasa, hatha yoga, and this yoga school is called Yoga Maze, and it's described as the Harvard School of Yoga. It's purely, not purely, it's, it's anatomy-based. There's a lot more of a science and scientific approach to movement than what you might sort of think of as the current trends in yoga. So I learned a lot about anatomy, a lot about joint function, a lot about mm. breaking poses down into component parts and modifying them using props. And I just kind of took it and ran with it because it just made so much sense to me. One of the biggest areas of focus is knowing the difference between a movement that is open chain and closed chain. And so you probably see me using blocks and cobra pose to place a block or two, depending on the flexibility of the student and the size of the student, between head and butt. And that was because of my envy of seeing people sit on their own heads. I just thought that must feel amazing to reach a destination with your back bend. And in fact, it does feel amazing. You don't need to sit on your head to feel that. You can place a prop between your head and your glutes and cobra or really any back bend. And that is called closing the chain. When you have something to grip onto, something to bite into, it provides feedback for that whole system of muscles and joints that are activated. So, mm. And that makes the pose active. Yeah? It's not just active. Whenever you have something to hold on to, you can apply as much force as you want onto it. And because the two endpoints are no longer moving towards each other, what's happening in the middle of it, 
So the ribs and, and middle back tend to really flourish when you close the chain in your back bend. Since those two endpoints can't get any closer to each other, the movement has to, has to circulate a little bit deeper, and it does circulate a little bit deeper through the middle of that line. Oftentimes, we're really cranking our neck backwards and back bend. So if you stop your head from moving, the rest of the chain has more opportunity and more directional information about where it is, proprioception about where it is in the pose. And it feels fantastic. It sounds lovely. Yeah. I mean, I've been using some of the stuff that you've been posting and it is, it's really great. I don't know. I'm super excited. I've, I just started doing, so the one you have where you take your, a yoga block and put it between your heel and your butt for like a hamstring activation. Mm -hmm. I've been using that, but for people, uh, knee hangs on trapeze. Yeah. And it's like, and they just get it right away. And it's like, because uh-huh. they have that feedback. So yes. it's super helpful. So you have them in knee hang and then you put the block between your heel and their butt. That's it. <laughs> Fucking genius. Thank you. Genius. Because someone asked me about single knee hangs and I was like, well, how, like, what are you using in your double knee hang? And they didn't know. So I tried to have them feel it on the floor, but they didn't quite get the transfer to the air. So I was like, well, it's the same body position. So let's do it. Awesome. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to try that as soon as possible, just so you know. (laughs) Yeah, perfect. I'm going to post it on Instagram this week so everyone will know what I'm talking about. Yeah, cool. So you have these chains, but I'm kind of interested in how you then get students to a place where they're doing movement, like going between poses, or what is the choreographic or artistic element of all of this, too? Well, if you take, for example, a drop back, Mm -hmm. standing, drop back to bridge, stand back up to your feet. If you were able to do that with a closed chain back bend, so squeezing something between your head and your butt, you might be able to feel the back bend. Think of it as an equation. The back bend becomes the constant. It's not really moving. It's staying in one spot and the variables sort of illuminate. It's like, oh, the variable is actually hip extension. Hip extension, maybe a little knee flexion, bending of the knees that helps me get my hands to the ground. And then to get back up, it's the same thing. Hip extension moves the hips forward over the toes so that enough weight is on the feet for me to stand up. And it's not a matter of changing the shape of my spine within the pose. It's about holding the constant of the back bend and working with the variables on and off. So it can help people to break down the components of what is actually happening whenever I'm transitioning. Because it's not everything changing all at once. It's too much for your body to digest. It's one piece whole, one piece is held, and other pieces are moved around that sort of constant element. Interesting. And can you do that for like, say, a front limber? It would be a little more challenging for something like a front limber, but I'm sure that I could dream up a... <laughs> or like a, a walkover or something? I'm just thinking like... For that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool. And then it doesn't seem like you do much hands-on like pushing. Yeah, or- I, I try not to. I Maybe I'm a little conservative for most contortion coaches and that I I don't like to exert my force on my students. If anything, my adjustments that I have are more using my body as a mobile prop for people to push into, pull against. It's my belief that the levers and tension within your body are more safely manipulated on your own. So if you're having trouble and you need help, let's use a prop to get you there. Let's use some method of modification to offload some of the tension. Let's change the vector and the angle. But I'd rather not push you there. Mm -hmm. And not everyone likes that. (laughs) And sometimes I have to remind them that like, hey, I can't get up on stage with you and do this overslip for you. I mean, this this is all you. We have to figure out how to get you there. I do believe that you are your own best coach. No matter what, you are translating information that you're hearing and applying it to your own practice. I like to empower my students to find ways to get there on their own. I'm not going to be there every time you practice, and I can't be there with you on stage to push your head to your feet. There's, we've got to find other ways to get 
results and it works. It really does. I've also been the victim of some pushing, which, you know, in gymnastics, which I, you did gymnastics as well. No, I was never a gymnast. I always Uh, wanted to be, but my mom wouldn't let me. (laughs) Smart mom. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. (laughs) We would do over splits after practice. We would practice for three or four hours. And then the last 30 minutes, we'd work on flexibility. And I remember our coaches would come around and they would stand or push on us. And it they would did, stand on you? They would put their foot on our back glute to okay. push our flexors down and then, you know, hands on the shoulders. They would do some standing and some pushing. Okay. And my inner being was like, no way, Jose. <laughs> that does not feel good. It doesn't feel right. And there were so many other things that did feel good and right. I just knew there was something off. And so what I began to do was I would resist them in terms of using their body as a prop to push into. So I would drive my split Mm. legs down into the floor to create some resistance to their pressure. And what it did is it stabilized the tendinous tissue around the hips and it actually allowed for safer flexibility. And so I, I took that lesson with me of like, you don't get results by driving as hard as you can in one direction until you hit a wall. Okay. You have to sort of back out of the parking space first before you decide to take off. And that sort of backing out of the pose, the unpose, if you will, is what sort of drives my hands-on adjustments. I give students something to push into. I change vectors, push into it again. I change vectors, push into it here. Then hold that by yourself. You know, there's a holding of the hand that needs to happen. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and let go and let you walk on your own. Do you have an age limit for your students? Oh, gosh, no, I don't. I. And I tend to attract, I think, like I said, people with special body types, people okay. advanced age, at least for contortion. I think the oldest I've worked with is mid-50s. And really, it all, for the most part, it all kind of looks the same. Mm. It's about developing the strength of your core muscles to manipulate your legs and limbs and spine in healthy, mindful, sustainable ways. Yeah, I definitely get students that are advanced age, and I also have worked with kids and teens and young adults. And you find your approach the same across the board? Depending on, it's more or less the same few exercises, but modified to fit where that student is jumping off from. Everyone's got their own jumping off point, but we're all kind of headed towards the same stream. We're all trying to get into that river and ride the, the waves. So it might look a little different, the approach, but Ultimately, there's a um, big through line that informs how I coach and where we go from there. Mm. How do you deal with mental blocks in your students and in yourself? Do you find them? What do you do? Certainly. I think, I think because what I, as opposed to like a gymnastic skill or an aerial acrobatic skill, there's not, there's some fear there. There's not as much fear and risk involved in contortion. So most of the mental blocks have to do with bad habits of thought, or I like to call it like sloppy thinking. Right, mm. now, right now, you're comparing yourself to her or him. Right now, you're feeling not good because you're remembering something that you used to be able to do. So I, I like to help keep my students present in what we're doing, lighthearted. It's kind of a matter of like keeping them engaged in what we're doing. and distracted with all the positive energy and good thoughts and (laughs) hopeful mentality rather than hopeless mentality. Let's be empowered. Let's be clear. Let's be focused. Do you like focusing? Yes. Then you like stretching. Yeah. Do you like being clear? Yes. Then you like conditioning. You know, it's, it's a matter of clarity and, you know, sometimes we experience contrast within the session of like, man, that wasn't, that wasn't easy or, oh, that doesn't feel good. Well, let's find a better thought first and then let's try again. So there's a habit among contortionists and circus people of perfectionism and being a perfectionist is not a bad thing, but let's make room for progress, you know? Mm-hmm. 
how do you feel about people on their cell phones when they're stretching their splits? This is a leading question. <laughs> I just want you to rant about it. <laughs> now, hold on. Did you see? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a while ago. When, when did I post that? I must have been in a really bad mood. It was so good, though. And this oh. is what I wish for Instagram. I wish there was just a, more of a sassiness to everybody's everything. Maybe I just need to start it for myself because oh, it was just so... I was literally in a split reading that post and like, God <laughs> damn it. He's, right. He's so right right now. I think I said, like, if... Texting and driving is distracting. How do you think it's affecting your splits? And I've got this whole thing about like, what's a split? And let's distinguish a split from a sit. Mm. Because split is not something that you arrive at. It's not like I got to the floor and now I get to relax. Sort of like that story of the over split pushing. There, there's activity that's happening in the split. There's the unpose. And I think actually Cirque Physio, Jen Crane posted about this once. She said, or maybe it was the movement maestro. <laughs> I think it was like the work that happens at the end range should be, it's something about like the duration, like it shouldn't last forever. Like it's, there's a, there's a time limit on what you do in your end range and it's going to be a lot shorter than what you're doing at a functional range. And so seeing people sort of with this mentality of like, oh, I'll just hold my split for seven minutes or I'll just stay here for three minutes and they're, you know, maybe just kind of sitting on the ground and distracted. And it's an element of stretching that I really wish to do away with in the culture of stretching of like, I'm just going to sit on the floor in my split and as soon as I'm on the ground, I'm going to take a picture of that split and here I am in my over split sitting on the floor. Aren't you proud of me? You know, meanwhile, there's a million things happening that I would love to address in that split. And it's not going to come without a lot of focus and energy and effort. So yeah, no texting and splitting while we're, while we're working together. Usually the phone, I try to keep the phones in the cubbies or in the bags so that like the focus is all there and, you know, we do our best. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, who are your influences as far as performing? Because you are still a performer. You work in LA. Yes. I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my influences. Well, before we got on this call, I watched about 30 minutes of gymnastics on YouTube from <laughs> 1980 Moscow Olympics. Oh, yes. I love 80s gymnastics, especially 80s Soviet gymnastics. I really do think that they figured something out in that era. And probably it was just the fact they had so much funding and they had lots of physios and they had a lot of really intricate, educated coaching happening. The attention to detail that those female and male Soviet gymnasts in the 80s had was just inspiring. And it's, that definitely inspires me as a performer because I, I just really enjoy seeing precision and artistry work together. So expression in terms of like what I've trained my whole life to do and expression on like who I am as a human being and a person. And I think like, you know, the gymnasts back then had more license to and more space within the sport to really express themselves. And it really looks like circus on a floor exercise mat. It's got a, it's got a story. It's got a tune. It makes you uh, excited and it puts you on the edge of your seat. So I guess I really, my influences are those references. 80s gymnastics. I'm going to have to go down that rabbit hole later. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll send you some links of floor exercises that'll just blow oh, your mind. Sweet. I can't and wait. It's the tumbling passes that are interesting. It's all the in-between stuff, all these weird little Valdez variations and walkovers and flipping around on the booty and just all, all types of unique elements. You can tell yes. that that was kind of created themselves or was the inspiration for from a coach that created it. And it's just awesome. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about circus, right? Is that you have this permission to not have to worry about score. So as long as it looks good, you can kind of do whatever you want. Absolutely. And you don't need to do all four, all six apparatuses. You get to pick what you're most passionate about 
And, you know, a lot of people are generalists. They have more than one trade and more than one apparatus and skill, but it's all based on your strengths. So you're never, or maybe not never, but you're usually not picking the thing that's hard for you to perform. You're performing something that's within your wheelhouse so that you can, within that movement, tell a story and have fun and be an example of joyful movement. And it's contagious. I mean, look at how much it's growing in our culture's zeitgeist circus. Yeah, it's super exciting. I always thought you had some rhythmic references for some reason. Oh, definitely. Yeah? Uh, Oh, yes. Yana Kudryasova. She was the 2013, 14, 15 world champion. I watch her on a loop. On a loop. <laughs> and mostly because she's rhythmic, but she's not as bendy as a Kanaeva, as a Kabaeva, like these type of girls that just, their back bends in one solid, like they're not sitting on their head, they're sitting on their own shoulders. Like their back mm. is just so mobile. Kudyasava was, she looked like a ballerina, on stage and she had of course lovely flexibility but what she did so well was juggled she was a great juggler she could juggle the movement the apparatus the music the facial expression the combination of technical and artistry with that athlete is really one of my only rhythmic obsessions otherwise i could go down that rabbit hole of like oh my gosh my back will never be like that or, you know, geez, I wish I I had that flexibility, but I really enjoy how that sport is extreme and how some people can find these loopholes within it to really dominate, even though they might not have the ideal A, B, or C. Just like you. Just like me. (laughs) (laughs) You make your own. Exactly. Make your own little moves and string together elements that are unexpected, that are playful, that are creative and quirky. And, you know, just take a moment for the audience to let it in and do your next thing. (laughs) Love it. Okay. So you have this thing in April coming up with Fit and Bendy. Fit and Bendy Bootcamp. Yes. April 20th through the 24th. What is it? It's a week long intensive flexibility intensive at Fit and Bendy in Los Angeles. I'll be working with Christina Nakaya, who is the owner and operator of Fit and Bendy. Uh, I've been working there since August and we've really developed a good rela- a good working relationship together. And so we've been inspired to create a week of intensive training where students can come and refine their skills and polish their practice and take away some really good points that help them continue on their journey as their own teacher advocating for their own best practices. Christina is really well known in the industry for helping contortionists rehab and prehab. So Mm. giving students really safe practices for deepening flexibility. And we really line up in so many different ways. So we'll be working together on the intensive to give students a really good delicious feast of flexibility, handstands, inversions, dance, choreography, anatomy, nutrition. We might do some photo shoots depending on the time we have available, do some outings where we see some local circus shows. Fun. Yeah, it's going to be- Sounds like a blast. Oh, it's going to be so fun. I can't wait. It's my first time really being a lead teacher in an intensive. So I'm super excited to to give students more exposure to my approach, to my coaching. Yeah, it sounds like you have so much that like a week seems like it would be almost enough time to get it all in. Uh, <laughs> like know. maybe. I know, right? It's like digesting a, a big feast. It'll take a little while for them to, and then they'll come back for more. Obviously. You can get <laughs> hungry again. You know, you always do. I want to Just go back to this because I think it's such a beautiful point and such a tricky line. And I feel this as a student and as a coach, actually. And it's that idea of like knowing what feels right versus trusting a coach. Yes. Do you know, like, and knowing like, oh, that's not right for my body and when and how to assert yourself in those ways. Yes. It's tricky because part of the reason why something might not feel right might have less to do with the drill that you're doing and more to do with your conditioning to perform that drill. 
so although I, I do advocate for like, you are your best coach, what you feel is valid. If something feels wrong, it is back up your car before you start driving off, right? Put it in reverse. Let's revisit some of the conditioning. Let's revisit some of the rehab, prehab exercises and see what we can do about it instead of sort of knocking over and over at that door and waiting for someone to answer. Let's like explore a couple more doors. Let's, let's see what options are out there and come back to this later. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I don't think every coach is willing to do that you know and sometimes that's what makes a coach really appealing it's like wow they really are not going to take my shit they're gonna push me and i need to be pushed well that might be right for some people and and in some cases you could really regret having ignored that inner voice that was saying stop don't wait not ready it, that's probably true I, I like to tell my students like if you're afraid that's an indication that we need to get stronger and or smarter about what we're doing and how we're approaching this. Mm. So as, as much as possible, especially as adults, it's important that we advocate for ourselves while we're training. And hopefully you have a coach that's willing to work with you in that way. And it's not easy to be a coach. I think people look to us as the experts. So we feel like Man, we got to be the expert and we got to, we got to be um, really sure about ourselves. And I don't think I'm one of the only coaches that does this, but I do feel like I'm in the minority of coaches that is willing to say, mm, that wasn't right. Ooh, that was my bad. Let's back it up. Or I don't really know what's going on here, but let's, let's stop and, and talk about it. Oh my God. I find the more I coach, the less I know, actually. <laughs> the more I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? Ah, I see this. What do you see? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Ah, it's a collaboration. That's and it. It's co-creation co between two, two people. I think the best thing as a coach that you can do is to prepare your students well for what they're hoping to accomplish. And working with flexible expectations, flexible goals and goal setting so that there's less emphasis on pass fail and more on cumulative experiential growth. The way that you experience something is way more valuable than the way I'm telling you to do something or I'm telling you how it should be. Um, I might be able to tell you how it feels for me to do it, but your experience of it is hands down the most nutritious, the most beneficial thing to learn from. I love that. My last question is always, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? And so that's what I'll ask you now. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Beginning of my career... Don't dance too hard at gay bars. <laughs> that was kind of a joke, but it was kind of real. It was kind of real. Don't. But don't. my, see, because my advice to myself would be dance harder at gay bars. So, like, what? <laughs> no, but it, it's kind of a Those long concrete time. floors will do it to you, though. Anyway. Well, sticky. It's. Don't. They're it's slippery, sticky. You never know what to expect. No, I think seriously, um, my advice would be, it would be YouTube search core and back conditioning Cirque du Soleil because that was what changed my career. I found a video online during a time in my life where I had an issue with my back, which was kind of in the middle of my career. If I'd, find, if I'd found that before, who knows what would have changed? Not that I want anything to change, but there's a video online and it has core and back conditioning. Uh, Cirque du Soleil performer is leading a CrossFit trainer through it. And my adaptation of that has informed my practice and changed it beyond recognition. Whoa. Um, better. So basically be curious. Do you curious. still have that YouTube link? I 100% do. And I... You send it to me? I will. I will send it to you. And you're going to freaking love it. And it's going to look really familiar to what I do. You're like, oh, that's what you're doing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. So like, be, be curious and remember that 
there's resources and tools online and available to you everywhere. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We'll obviously like link to everything that you've mentioned today, as well as your own website, MichaelWaltersMovement.com. Is that right? Yes, that is. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Yay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Micah. Thank you, Shannon. That was my interview with Micah Walters. As I said at the beginning in the intro, if you want to check out some of the concept we talked about in reference to flexibility, so things like the pose and the unposed or open and closed chain movements, you can certainly check out Micah Walters on Instagram at micah.walters.movement. And this week, I will also be posting on my own Instagram account some illustrations of this. And I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. To wrap up, though, I want to make two points that are a little more conceptual as opposed to the physical and technical information that Micah shared so eloquently. The two things that I want to touch on are coaching yourself and this concept of sloppy thinking. So when we're talking about getting a coach, I am a strong advocate for it. I am always saying when people are asking me questions online, the best thing that you can do for your specific situation is find someone who is knowledgeable and can be where you are and actually see what's happening with your body so that they can answer your specific questions for your specific situation. Now, sometimes you may have a coach who is capable of doing that. Maybe they're not, but they still have more information than you. But it's important, especially when you're an adult coming to flexibility, aerial, tumbling, juggling, anything, to also be your own coach, to develop your own internal system of understanding what works for you, what feels good, and what doesn't feel safe, and finding ways to communicate that with your coach. So often I see people who just kind of blindly, and I did this too for a long time, just kind of blindly gave over myself to a coach. I thought that to be super obedient was what the coach wanted and what I needed to succeed. But really I found that if you're more collaborative, if you treat a private lesson or a class more as a collaborative experience where you're listening to your own internal situation, you're evaluating the movement or the pose or the skill based on your own feelings and your own physical limitations and strengths, you're going to have a much better experience and your outcome is going to be a lot greater. And the other thing that Micah talked about was this concept of sloppy thinking. He talked about this in terms of mental blocks. So when people get frustrated or when people don't feel like they're making progress or going any farther, sometimes the answer is physical or you need to change the strengthening exercises you're doing or the type of movement practice you're engaging in. But sometimes the answer is mental. Sometimes what's happening is you're telling yourself you can't do something or that something is hard. And as a result, it becomes hard and something you can't do. So before you start to change everything entirely or totally give up, stop for a moment and notice the thoughts that are going on in your head. Because sometimes just a change in mindset can be the way to bust through a mental block. And I think Micah's practice in yoga and meditation and his work internally is what makes him such a powerful teacher. Micah referenced a whole bunch of really cool videos, and they will be in the show notes. So anywhere that you go, you can click down and you'll see them there. They'll also be on the website, theartistathlete.com slash podcasts. To find Micah, again, I've plugged his Instagram account like 20 times, but it's at micah.walters.movement, and he's online, micahwaltersmovement.com. 
As always, you can find your girl posting aerial training tips and inspiration on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. I'm on Facebook, The Artist Athlete. My website is theartistathlete.com. And that Patreon address, one more time for the people in the back, patreon.com slash theartistathlete. It's an L.A. month, apparently, on the podcast. Next week, I have Womack and Bowman coming on, so make sure you subscribe so you get that episode fresh in your inbox next week. Talk at you next week, friends, fans, and enemies. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Aloha. My name is Beth Russell, and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee, and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the cities, feel free to stop by the aviary minneapolis it's a great time with that i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye hey there artists and athletes this is andy smith owner and artistic director at saltaire circus school in jacksonville beach florida and i want to thank you for contributing to the artist athlete podcast if you ever find yourself down in florida come check us out whether you're an artist athlete or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.